In the 1962 season, Oscar Robertson scored 2,432 points. 50 years later, Kevin Durant scored 1,850. So, who had a better scoring season? Of course, we know from part two of this series that we need far more context to answer this question. For instance, we could compare their scoring efficiency to the league average that year to gain a little more insight. Based on total points and efficiency, Robertson looks like a vastly superior scorer. Of course, the traditional way to gauge scoring volume in basketball isn't to look at season totals like this, these aren't home runs in baseball, but instead to convert them to per game averages as a way to level the playing field. In this case, Durant averaged 28 per game and Oscar 31. But how much more have we really leveled the playing field here? I mean, what if one player logged more minutes per game? Oscar played 44 minutes a night to Durant's 38, so Robertson indeed had more time to score all those points. If we use per game stats, we wouldn't be able to see their production per minute. We'd think players who dominate in shorter time periods were less effective than they really were. Because of this, rates per minute became popular in the 2000s. This is a way to control for playing time to understand how frequently a player scored or rebounded or did anything per minute. Robertson scored 25 points per 36 minutes in 1962 and Durant 26 per 36. So when accounting for minutes played, Oscar's apparent scoring edge goes away. In baseball, all regulation games have nine innings, regardless of how long they take to play teams alternate batting back and forth only those nine times. Basketball is the inverse. It takes 48 minutes to play, regardless of how many back and forth possessions there are. This means one 48 minute game can have 90 possessions and another one can have 130 possessions. So per minute stats don't tell us how likely someone is to score on each possession. Back in part one of this series, we compared Michael Adams to Magic Johnson and in 1991, Adams' Nuggets scored 120 points per game, and Magic's Lakers just 106. Traditional thinking would view Denver as a better offensive team, but the Nuggets had way more opportunities to score those points. They averaged 114 possessions per game, whereas the slower Lakers only averaged 94. So per possession, the Lakers were one of the most efficient offenses in the league, while the Nuggets were below average. It turns out that per possession efficiencies like this almost perfectly predict team performance in basketball, whereas per game averages do not. This was a major breakthrough popularized by Dean Oliver in his seminal book Basketball on Paper in 2004. It's also why we've revised our ideas about players and teams. Bill Russell's Celtics were viewed as an offensively successful team because they played at a fast pace and led the league in points per game. but they weren't actually that efficient on offense per possession. Instead, they smothered teams defensively, only the emphasis on their per game numbers masks that defensive prowess. Sometimes using per possession numbers is cumbersome. It's awkward to say Magic averaged 0.17 assists per possession. So instead, these are often expressed as per 100 possession values. It's easier to say he averaged 17 assists per 100 possessions, or LA's offense scored 112 points per 100 instead of 1.12 points per possession. This per 100 number is now simply known as a team's offensive rating or overall offensive efficiency. The amount of points they give up per 100 possessions is a team's defensive rating. We can compare these numbers to the league average to figure out just how teams are winning games. A plus five offense is a 115 offensive efficiency in a season where the average team's offense is 110. This gives them a five point edge over their opponents and a team's edge over the league on offense and defense combined to predict its net rating, which is more predictive of future success in a season than their current win percentage. The number of possessions a team racks up in a standard game is known as pace, which has zero correlation with how good a team is. The best teams play slow and fast, and the worst teams play slow and fast, which is exactly why per possession efficiencies are so informative. In the case of Durant and Oscar, Oscar's Royals played an incredible 129 possessions per game to Oklahoma City's 93. 
If we estimate the number of possessions they took to score their points, Durant averaged 37.5 per 100 and Oscar 26.8. We can now clearly see Durant scored way more often than Robertson, about 40% more per trip down the court. Since most modern players now play around 75 possessions in a game, we'll sometimes express player stat lines as per 75 possessions so that they're a bit more intuitive. Most advancements in basketball stats have followed these same principles. How can we apply more context to better answer questions we're interested in? For instance, how good is someone at rebounding? Stop for a second and think about how we could measure this. I mean, we could look at rebounds per game, but we already know that doesn't account for minutes played or pace of the game. We could look at rebounds per 100 possessions, but that doesn't factor in how often teams are missing shots. It doesn't take into account how many rebounds are available to grab. This thought gave birth to rebounding percentages or rebounding rates which is the percentage of available rebounds a player grabs while he's in the game. Again, this creates a more even playing field to compare rebounding in games with 50 misses versus 100 misses. Similar adjustments were made to other stats too. Assist percentage takes into account how many shots a player's teammates actually made. Block percentage is a rate of blocking two point shots only, an adjustment that puts rim protectors on a more even playing field, regardless of how many threes the opponent shot against them. These advancements added context to traditional stats, but they didn't always get us all the way to our answers. Take pace. We often want to diagnose whether a team is playing fast on offense, but pace includes the other team's offensive speed too. Over the course of the game, this generally comes out in the wash, but opponents sometimes speed up to take advantage of slowness, or in the case of Golden State this year, slow themselves down against certain teams. The 2019 Warriors ended up with the third fastest offense, but the 10th fastest pace, because teams took a long time trying to score on their defense. Pace is generally a great measure of game speed, but time of possession data when available is even more accurate. Then there are Oliver's four factors, turnovers, free throws, shooting efficiency, and rebounding, with some simple adjustments that were intended to model team success. Turnovers are adjusted to turnover percentage, that's just the percentage of possessions that end with a turnover. Shooting efficiency is captured by effective field goal percentage, which we discussed in part two. He used free throws per field goal attempt as a way to measure how often a team got to the line. And finally, offensive rebounding to see how often a team keeps a possession alive. These four factors identify how a team's possessions end, and with them we can largely represent the overall offensive and defensive efficiency of a team, but never perfectly. Note that the four factors can't be manipulated in a vacuum to improve efficiency, and that overall points per possession is the outcome we really care about, not say turnover percentage or free throw attempts. Teams increase efficiency by generating easier scoring attempts and then cashing in on those opportunities, so a better three-point shooter will make more open threes, but a deliberate attempt to reduce turnovers, for example, won't necessarily improve a team's offense if it doesn't lead to easier scoring chances. The easiest way to see this is to swap out a low turnover guard like Stefan Marbury for a higher turnover one like Jason Kidd. When this happened in 2002, not only did New Jersey's offense improve, but its turnover rate declined. More on this in part four. We can see the same issue with offensive rebounding as well. League offensive rebounding rates have plummeted in the last decade due to deliberate offensive strategies. Yet, foregoing offensive rebounding has helped teams become more efficient, not because offensive rebounding isn't helpful, but because the strategic trade-offs are even more helpful. Teams not only get back to avoid transition, but they shoot way more threes, which means fewer rebounders near the hoop, and fewer good rebounders near the hoop when stretch big men are out on the perimeter. As a result, three-point shots are far less likely to be rebounded by the offense than twos because shots closer to the basket have higher offensive rebounding rates in general than longer twos and threes. This makes sense given that the shooter is closer, so there's another rebounder near the hoop, and penetration can draw defensive attention and help open putback chances for nearby teammates. 
By the way, there's a thought that teams have become too conservative with offensive rebounding tactics. There are links to studies in the description box below, but what's apparent is that most teams are opportunistic if they're in good position to crash in for a rebound, but otherwise if boards aren't nearby, they'll run back on D. Later in the series, we'll see how we can refine rebounding value even more. For now, the takeaways from part three are this. One, basketball is a possession-based game, so per possession stats almost always describe teams and players the most accurately. Two, other adjustments add context and intelligence to our measurements. For example, rebounding percentage is more precise than rebounds per 100, but there can be more to figure out. Rebounding depends on team strategy and is complex and dynamic. Finally, a team's net rating is the result of offensive efficiency and defensive efficiency combined, which almost describes its effectiveness perfectly. So if you want to predict future performance, don't look at a team's win percentage. Instead, look at their margin of victory. There are further resources in the description box on win percentage and margin of victory for teams, along with some deeper dives on the four factors and rebounding rates. All of the player art in this series is created by Crumpled Jumper. He's a fun Twitter follow, at Crumpled Jumper. A special thanks to him and to every Patreon subscriber for making this possible, and I hope you're all having a great day.